Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Unraveling Biology and Identifying Targets with Functional Genomic Approaches, supported by Linty Array CRISPR Library Screens, presented by Dr. David Piper, Director of R&D Cell Biology, Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm Julie Simroth of Labritz, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific Incorporation is the world leader in serving science with revenues of $18 billion and more than 55,000 employees globally. Their mission is to enable their customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. They help their customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. Through their premier brands, Thermo Scientific, Applied Biosystems, Invitrogen, Fisher Scientific, and Unity Lab Services, they offer an unmatched combination of innovative technologies, purchasing convenience, and comprehensive support. For more information, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. For questions not answered today, we will follow up with participants via email. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the icon located on the lower right of the screen. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. David Piper. Dr. Piper has led teams at Thermo Fisher Scientific for over 10 years in the development of products and services for cellular engineering, biochemical assays, and cell-based assays for the screening of multiple target classes, ion channels, GPCRs, kinases, nuclear receptors, pathway profiling, and next generation solutions for drug discovery using IPSC-based approaches. These efforts are directed at generating more pathophysiologically relevant cell models through the use of reprogramming, stem cell culture, characterization and differentiation, genomic engineering, and assay development. Currently, as an R&D director for the cell biology and synthetic biology businesses, he leads teams that provide molecular biology and cellular biology services, including cDNA library synthesis, high-throughput cloning, CRISPR and Talon design and generation, Linty virus generation, BACMAM virus generation, cell engineering, multiple delivery and integration platforms, assay development, multiple detection formats, Linty array, CRISPR libraries, and functional genomics screening using either siRNA or CRISPR-based approaches. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Piper. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Julie, thank you for that introduction and to all of our participants. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and advance to the next slide here. As mentioned, I'd like to, to share with you today some of our thoughts around how to use the CRISPR-Cas9 CRISPR platform uh, for target identification. Um, and just to kind of ground everyone there, uh, a reminder that that process is, is really about identifying the direct molecular target, uh, typically a protein, but in some cases nucleic acids, of a small molecule, disease, or specific phenotype. And you know, I bring that up because we often think about it in terms of disease. Uh, so when we look at the lower panel there, we think often about target identification as it relates to human disease. But oftentimes in, in our screening paradigms today, we do phenotypic-based assays that are hopefully modeling that disease in an in vitro cellular state. And when we find compounds or, or other hits uh, in those assays, it often requires unraveling what the target of that compound was. Uh, so target ID can be used in both those sorts of situations. Um, and what these CRISPR libraries may allow us to do is to really systematically knock out individual genes within a cell or pathway and thereby identify those key genes 
that contribute to that phenotype or that disease and help us translate a picture of human disease uh, or phenotypic assays to tangible targets that can be followed up upon in drug discovery or basic research. Now, I suspect everyone on this call is well aware of what the CRISPR-Cas9 technology is, but again, as, a, as just a quick anchor point, um, this is uh, an innate bacterial immunity system discovered by Jennifer Duodna's lab and elucidated further by Emmanuel Charpentier, uh, Feng Zhang, George Church, and others, and ported into mammalian systems whereby the Cas9 nuclease, depicted here as the green sort of blobular structure, and the guide RNA shown in the dotted circles, uh, act as a concerted complex, the ribonucleoprotein complex, to be directed in a specific way to double-stranded DNA, uh, where, it, where the nuclease then can make a double-stranded break. And that double-stranded break uh, can be repaired by non-homologous end joining which often results in the formation of an indel, and if that indel creates a frame shift, we can often thereby generate knockouts of genes, which is what we'll be talking about today. Of course, donor DNA can also be included there to modify the DNA in other fashions, but today we'll restrict the discussion to the idea of making a knockout at the specific site that the Cas9 RNP complex has been directed at. Now, of course, knockdown studies have been used for decades now, uh, following on uh, the use of siRNA as well as shRNA, uh, and both of these approaches still carry a, a high degree of validity and actually in combination with these approaches create a great orthogonal or counter screen. The main difference, of course, is with siRNA or shRNA, you are knocking down the message uh, not the gene. In some cases, you can get incomplete delivery or incomplete knockdown of that message, and for those reasons, in some cases, that data has been challenging to interpret. One of the promises of using Cas9 CRISPR systems here is that we expect to see complete and permanent knockout of a gene and expect that to give us a more penetrate and more specific phenotype in the cells uh, that have been addressed. So what have we built to support this? Um, we have two different systems, and again, I'm sure many of you are aware with the pooled uh, lentiviral approaches that people have taken and published in the literature now over the past couple of years. Um, we do have pooled libraries available where we have generated lentiviral uh, guide RNAs uh, targeting uh, approximately 10 guides per gene in the pooled approach. Um, and these come uh, delivered as ready-to-use high titer lentivirus um, with a very extensive QC around the guide RNA representation. What I'm going to focus on today, however, is on the left side, which is our Lenti Array CRISPR libraries, wherein we have generated libraries with guide RNAs that target a specific gene in each well with four guide RNAs per gene target. So we've generated 96 well plates with about 80 of those wells filled, and each well, again, targets one specific gene with up to four guides per gene. And we've organized the entire human genome into subsets. So we have about 17 sub-libraries that are based on gene families and or functional biology. And then for the things that don't tuck into that very neatly, we have two broad sets, one that we refer to as the druggable genome. Uh, so genes that uh, the field believes are druggable uh, based on a number of uh, aspects about where those genes are expressed typically. Uh, and then the rest of the whole genome, which we'd simply refer to as the whole genome. So how are these libraries constructed? Um, on the left, I have a illustration of the p lenti Cas9 P2A blastocedon vector that we use to generate lentivirus expressing the Cas9 nuclease. Now here we have an EF1 alpha promoter driving the Cas9 uh, open reading frame, and we have that connected via a, a P2A element to blastocedon resistance 
So when you use this lenti particle, uh, it will transiently express Cas9, or if you apply blastocedin antibiotics to the cells in an appropriate way, you'll be able to select a pool of cells that are now stably expressing Cas9 due to integration of the, of the lentiviral vector. On the right, we have the illustrated vector for the guide RNAs. Here we have a U6 promoter driving the unique uh, guide RNA. Uh, then following that, we have uh, a separate promoter, the EF-alpha promoter here, driving pyromyosin resistance. So again, each particle expresses a single guided RNA from a U6 promoter, and the pyromyosin resistance is driven by a separate EF1-alpha promoter, and of course all these constructs are sequence verified. So the pyromyosin here, again, allows you to use these vectors in either a transient application or in cell types where transduction may be suboptimal, say less than 80 or 70 percent, uh, you can add pyromyosin to increase uh, and enrich the population for the cells that have received the guides. Now, in addition to the libraries, we also have a few control particles that are important and helpful in assay development. So remember, and I will state this more than once, a key to a good screen is strong assay development. So you really want to make sure that you understand how your cells are behaving, uh, how they're responding to the virus, how they're responding to specific control positive and negative guide RNAs. So our controls are set up uh, similar to the guide structure with a U6 promoter driving the guide followed by an EF1 alpha promoter uh, driving a, a GFP cassette with a P2A element uh, connected to pyromyosin. Now these can also be made available without the GFP. Uh, however, with the GFP, uh, it does allow you to use these vectors to infect your cells or transduce your cells with the viral particles and understand the transduction efficiency uh, and to help you dial in the MOI of the viral transduction based on purely the expression of the GFP. So this can be a very helpful uh, point at the beginning. And these are made uh, with guides targeting the HPRT gene, um, which in many cases we expect to be an inert uh, gene with respect to biological, certain biological pathways. Uh, and then we also have, uh, although we do expect it to cut that gene, and it does allow you for a positive marker for cleavage. Uh, and we also have negatives using a scrambled non-targeting uh, guide, which we expect to have no impact on either cleavage or biology. So the libraries themselves are designed using a series of rules. Uh, these are based on the latest findings uh, of specificity and efficiency of guide RNA binding, as well as the in-house experience that we have here at Thermo Fisher Scientific. So first, we identify the target loci where indel formation will result, or where we expect it to result in knockout of all the isoforms of, of a particular gene. So we look for the most five prime constitutively expressed exons for any particular gene. We then identify all the available guide RNAs in those locations. And then we score and filter those available guide RNAs based on their expected binding efficiency of the ribonucleoprotein complex to the target sequence. And we apply a series of rules that assess sequence complexity, GC content, the protospa protospacer adjacent motif, or the PAM sequence preference, and the nucleotide positional preference. With those remaining guides, we score those further based on the sequence specificity. So we take that series of top guides and we bioinformatically look at all of the potential off-target sites and we take the top guides with the least number of off-targets and then filter out any overlapping sequences and now have the top four highest scoring guides that we include in the library build.
So I just gave you a description of sort of how we've organized the libraries, how we have designed the vector backbones, and how we've designed the guides. And now what I'll talk about is how do we use those libraries to develop an assay and, and generate or execute a screen. So the first is, of course, to identify and obtain the CRISPR library that you want to use. What is the content that you would like to target? The second is to identify the proper cell background for the phenotype or the disease that you're interested in, as well as an assay that will allow you to interrogate the biology of interest in that cell background. The next milestone in your, in your journey will be to transduce uh, and, and to optimize the transduction and the assay itself, so not just uh, optimizing how you get the virus in and optimizing cleavage, but optimizing the readout and, and the time required to get the best readout possible. Uh, and then once you've done that, you can move forward with your CRISPR library screen. Um, now, I will talk about all these steps, and I just will at this point also uh, let you know that in addition to providing these libraries, uh, my teams do provide this workflow as a service. Um, so if uh, for any reason you may have the, the desire to outsource it, um, that is a, a, a function that we make available. Now this is uh, the first step, again, what, uh, what library, what content are you interested in? So these are the subsets of the genes that I mentioned earlier. The top 17 uh, there are shown, and uh, they are all available now with uh, the exception of the transcription factor set, which we expect to roll out in about one week. Uh, and then the druggable genome and the whole genome are, are going through production now, and we expect those to be wrapped up uh, by the end of Q3 and Q4 of this year, respectively. And again, you can see here the number of genes in each set and the number of guides, which again typically is, is four times the number of genes. So on the next slide here, I'm showing you the types of cleavage efficiency that we can obtain by using this lentiviral approach. On the top, we're comparing two different methods of generating the Cas9 CRISPR RNP complex. So on the very top line, we're simply transducing uh, these HT1080 cells with both a Cas9 lentiviral particle and the arrayed guide RNA lentiviral particles, then selecting with pyromycin for five days and then looking at cleavage at the specific gene using our genomic cleavage detection assay kit, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, there the basic idea is we're looking for formation of heteroduplexes that occur uh, if we've created indels. That heteroduplex uh, typically results in a, in a bubble, and that, that bubble can be cut by an endonuclease, and when we run those products out on a gel, we can clearly see a difference in the cleavage which you'll see on the gels on the lower part of this slide. Um, so in the top left panel, for instance, we have the negative control with the dual infection shown in red uh, and the stable cell line shown in blue. Um, so yeah, the stable cell line there, we're just applying uh, the guide RNA lentiviral particles directly to an HT1080 that has been generated to stably express a Cas9 and I'll talk about how we do that in the next slide. Um, so in the dual and the stable, uh, for the negative on the top left, you see uh, single bands indicating that there was no cleavage um, at, at sites related to that negative control. However, when we start looking at genes, for instance, the PRKCQ gene, you can see in the dual infection uh, when we've got the uh, all the components there, we get uh, a lower band on, on the bottom left, and we get about a 90.6 cleavage efficiency when we compare the density of the lower band to the upper. And on the stable, we get about 65%. When you look through the genes overall, uh, you can see for FLT1, we get about 73 in the dual, about 53 in the stable, 87 and 74 for ERN2. Uh, 56 and 72 for CLK1, 88 and 82 for ARAF. Um, moving over to the other side, on the bottom right, CAMK4, 83 and 90. So generally these numbers are in sort of the same ballpark, uh, 
uh, in some cases, the dual infection gave us better, uh, better targeting than the stable, and in other cases, the stable. Um, you know, again, I think that at the end of the day, the approach that you use is going to be very cell type specific. It's worth testing both, uh, and in some cases, the stable will give you more robust results and repeatable. But in others, um, that may not be that may not be an option based on the longevity or the passage limit of a, of the cell, for instance. Um, now, the other piece, as I mentioned, is a biological endpoint. So you choose your group of targets, uh, which have been uh, organized and, and, and QC'd by us. Uh, you choose a cell background, and you choose an assay. Now, we have multiple functional assays uh, in our molecular probes and in our discovery portfolios. Um, these include a number of things that allow you to measure cell health, for instance, our live dead assay, our Presto Blue metabolic assay, our cell event uh, caspase assay. We have uh, reagents that allow us to look at uh, mitochondrial redox and, and uh, overall uh, cell-based redox states. We have a number of pathway-based cells, our cell sensor platform, uh, that allows you to look at the activation of an entire pathway, and I'll talk a little bit more about that today. We have our Lantha screen assays that allow you to interrogate post-translational modification using TR-FRET readouts. And we have other reporter genes, such as luciferase and beta-galactosidase, available. From the high-content screening perspective, we have ways of interrogating protein localization and translocation. Uh, we can also do reporter gene expression assays, neurite outgrowth, um, migration, et cetera. And we have a number of ways of looking at second messenger signaling, calcium flux, membrane potential, um, ion channels looking at uh, potassium flux using our fluxor reagent. So a wide range of ways to interrogate the biology. Um, and it's just, again, a question of what is the, the disease uh, and the proper model that you want to be using. So again, what I'll talk to you today about is how we used the libraries to set up an assay using one of our cell sensor lines. Uh, these use a beta-lactamase reporter technology to provide a very rapid and sensitive method for looking at signal transduction pathways. Shown here is a picture of the substrate. Um, and what you'll note is that we have a, a coumarin-like molecule shown on the left uh, that can be excited by 409 nanometer light. And that is linked to a fluorescein or a fitzy like molecule shown in green that can emit when excited at 520 nanometer light. And those are connected through a beta-lactam ring, which is shown in red. Now, when the beta-lactamase enzyme is expressed, it cleaves that beta-lactam ring, liberating these two fluorophores. And now, if you excite the blue fluorophore, with the 409 nanometer light, it will emit 447 because it does not transfer energy to the green fluorophore. So we have a nice ratiometric way of measuring this substrate, which is also uh, provides very high signal to noise in these assays, uh, makes the assay less dependent on uh, cell number, uh, helps uh, normalize against bleaching or efflux of the dye by certain cells that may try to pump it out, uh, as well as against artifacts that may come from plate readers like uh, light flash, et cetera. Now, we're going to be using our ME180 NF kappa B cell line. So shown on the left is the pathway in its most simplistic form in this cell line. Um, in the ME180 cell, which is a cancer cell line, we can activate the TNF alpha receptor, which uh, once activated, activates TRAD and the IKK complex. This ultimately results in dephosphorylation of IK beta alpha and release of the NF kappa B complex, which can now translocate to the nucleus bind the NF-kappa B response element, which we have in front of the beta-lactamase enzyme, and it can drive expression of the beta-lactamase enzyme. So of course, these cells are stably expressing cells that we've previously engineered with a response element driving the beta-lactamase enzyme and have qualified extensively uh, for small molecule screening. 
Uh, we have about 60 of these cell lines that represent about 26 different pathways associated with things such as inflammation, cancer, toxicity, uh, development, stress, etc. And each of them has a very uh, thick, in most cases, thick validation pack that describes how the cell line was made, how the small molecule assay was validated, and in many cases how the pathway was validated by knocking out key components uh, with siRNA uh, to, to validate uh, the biology of the cell. And you can see on the right here, uh, in the absence of TNF-alpha, the pathway is off. And when we load the cells with this FRET-based substrate, our live blazer substrate, you can see that as we excite the cells with blue light, they appear green because of the FRET-based reaction of the substrate. However, on the bottom right, when we add TNF-alpha, the enzyme is expressed. Uh, it cleaves that beta-lactam ring. And again, uh, now when we excite with blue light, uh, excite the blue fluorophore, we see emission of the blue fluorophore, and the cells appear blue. So the next step for us was to take that cell line and generate a stable Cas9 expressing cell line using our Lentia array Cas9 virus. So we simply transduced. Uh, we added blastocetin. Of course, we, we ran an antibiotic kill curve to determine the appropriate concentration of blastocetin to use. And we added it, uh, selected for about 14 to 21 days. We clonally isolated the cells and expanded those and then characterized and validated individual clones by both Western blot, shown on the bottom left. So you see a number of clones there depicted with a alphanumeric number uh, and the beta actin staining that goes along with that to normalize. And then on the right, you'll see some of those same clones tested in a cleavage analysis assay at the HPRT locus. So here we choose the clones that had the lowest level of Cas9 expression, but gave the highest level of cleavage and showed the same morphology as the parent and the same growth rates as the parent. Okay? And you will note that the cleavage analysis does vary a little bit more significantly than one might expect based on simply the expression level. So we do absolutely suggest that if you're going to go through the trouble of clonally isolating cells, that you do base your decision on which clone to use on the cleavage analysis. And again, the morphology and the growth rate of those cells. So next, we wanted to optimize the assay. So we took that Cas9 stable cell line, and on the top two panels, you'll see that we plated cells out at two different cell densities in a 384 well plate. And we tested four different MOIs, one through four. And we examined HPRT, TRAD, and beta-lactamase itself. Now, HPRT, we expect to have no impact on the NF-kappa-B pathway. TRAD, as I showed you, as an early player in that pathway, if we knock it out, we should have a significant impact on the pathway. And beta-lactamase, of course, being the reporter enzyme itself, if we knock it out, we should essentially eliminate the signal. So we're looking for an MOI condition that gives us essentially no effect at the HPRT and the greatest effect at the TRADD and BLA targets. And what we decided here was looking at the blue bars of an MOI of two. Uh, we really get good and significant knockdown of TRAD and BLA, and they're relatively equivalent at either 1,000 or 2,000 cells per well. We also looked at whether or not we needed to use spin oculation during our transduction protocol and how far out we needed to read the assay. Of course, when you knock out the gene, after that's been done, you need to wait for the transcript to decay, and you need to wait for the protein to decay. Uh, so there is some timing aspect. And again, we want to make sure that we've optimized the assay window to be as big as possible in the shortest amount of time. So what we see here is that we really saw no difference in the use of spin oculation. That's the red versus the blue bars in the middle panels. And from day five to day eight, we really saw no significant difference either. Um, so this could be read out as early as day five, and spin oculation was optional or unnecessary. We also tested whether or not we needed pyromycin selection on the cells, and we looked at that at day five and day nine. And what you'll see then in those bottom panels is, again, Comparing the red to the blue bars, very little difference as to whether or not we included pyromycin. Uh, and 
very little difference between day five and day nine. Uh, you know, a little bit of a, a, a smaller, a little bit more inhibition at TRAD, but not terribly significant. So we felt uh, it was best for us uh, in this assay to go ahead and read out at day five uh, and to omit the pyramycin selection because we were getting very high levels of transduction uh, using the methods that uh, we had optimized. So how does it look? Here's an example then of taking that Cas9 expressing cell sensor NF kappa B ME180 line, adding our guide RNA particles, and then four days post transduction, adding TNF alpha, and making our measurement. So on the bottom panel, again on the left, you see in the absence of TNF alpha, all the cells are green because there is no beta lactamase, the pathway is not on. When we add TNF alpha, in the presence of the scrambled control or the HPRT control, most of the cells are blue because we have turned the pathway on and we can now see engagement of the reporter. However, when we knock out beta-lactamase on the top right or the TNF-alpha receptor on the bottom left or IKK-alpha in the bottom middle or TRAD on the bottom right, most of the cells are green because we have now disrupted the pathway and the beta-lactamase enzyme is either not made or knocked out uh, and uh, the, the substrate remains intact. So this looked great. And here's a little blow up of the TNF-alpha receptor knockout. I just want you to appreciate how penetrant this is. Nearly 100% of the cells shown in this field are green, indicating that they were knocked out. So we wanted to do a little bit of a verification on that assay. Uh, we followed up on a few of the specific hits here, or the specific controls. We asked, when looking at TRAD or IKK-alpha, for instance, uh, we did genomic analysis of the target sites by next-gen sequencing using our ion torrent, PGM, and, and or proton platforms. And what you'll see for TRAD is that we're getting uh, somewhere on the order of 98% indel formation, and for IKK-alpha, somewhere on the order of 83 84%. So that looked pretty good. Uh, we next looked at the proteins themselves, and you can see below uh, the cells were expanded for 14 days, and we ran uh, Western blots. In the case of no guide RNA on the bottom left panel, you can see a very clear band for the IKK alpha, uh, whereas in the knockout cells, uh, there's essentially no band there. Likewise, on the right, uh, for TRAD, when we look in the no-guide RNA-treated cells, we can see a clear band, whereas when we look at the TRAD knockout, there's essentially no band visible. Uh, on top, again, we, we quantitated that functionally using the live blazer substrate, and with the TRAD and the IKK-alpha, you can see the large bulk of the cells are green, again, indicating uh, knockout of that pathway, and when we quantitate that uh, by measuring the blue-green ratio using the substrate and comparing it to the control situations, we get about a 90% knockout or 90% inhibition of the pathway by the TRAD knockout and around 83% by the IKK alpha. So again, this looked very good to us. We are getting a very high rate of indel formation, a very clear and high rate of protein knockout, and a very clear and correlative functional knockout uh, that could be quantitated using our live blazer assay. We did one final secondary verification using immunocytochemical techniques. And what you can see on the far left in the panel of 6 uh, A through H, uh, on top we have a some, some microscopic uh, immunofluorescent micrographs in the absence of TNF-alpha, that's panels A through D, and on the bottom in the presence of TNF-alpha. So in the absence of guide RNA, you can see in blue the nucleus, uh, and in uh, green you can see the NF-kappa uh, NF B GFP fusion protein. Uh, and the translocation of that protein is evident in panel E compared to panel A when we add TNF-alpha. However, 
when we add, uh, when we look at the trad knockout or the IKK alpha knockout in panels C and D, in the absence of TNF alpha, you see the cytosolic distribution of NF kappa B, and in the presence of TNF alpha in panels G and H, you see a persistent cytosolic localization of NF kappa B instead of the nuclear localization that you see in panel E. So this is just an orthogonal assay that allowed us to functionally validate what we are seeing in the cell sensor assay. And on the right, uh, we also looked at IKK alpha using an antibody against IKK alpha. And you can see in the uh, no guide RNA, in the presence and absence of TNF alpha, we have, uh, uh, this is a phospho-specific antibody. We have uh, uh, activation of IKK alpha that you can see in panel C. Uh, but in panel D, uh, that's absent uh, because we've knocked out IKK alpha entirely. Okay, so we felt really good about the assay development. Our controls are behaving the way we expect. Our cleavage, our protein knockout, our functional assays are behaving the way we expect. We now embarked on setting up the assay. So as mentioned, we used our optimized assay variables in a 384 well plate, 1,000 cells per well, MOI of two. We tested three wells for each target, unstim and stim, and we used a number of controls on each plate. No cells, no lentivirus, which is a negative control, of course, HPRT, GFP, which was a negative control, and a transduction control, beta-lactamase, which was a positive control that we consider a technical control, and then a number of genes that we know to be related to the pathway, CFOS, IKK-alpha, and TNF-alpha receptor, uh, which are all biological controls. And again, I think this is very important when you run these screens that you maintain a series of controls on each plate so that you can understand uh, that your assay is working as intended on each plate and you can interpret your data appropriately. For our screen, we use the Lenti Array CRISPR Human Kinase Library, which has about 840 targets. And on the right, you see the assay protocol. We seeded the cells in 5% growth medium, 30 microliters per well, spun the plate for two minutes at room temp, added the lentivirus in 5% growth media at an MOI of two with polybrine at 10 microliters per well, spun those plates for 30 minutes at room temperature, incubated, and on day five, added medium with 5x stimulation buffer, incubated again for about five hours, load with the BLA substrate, and read the BLA assay. This slide shows you a plate map of all the targets and controls that I just mentioned. So again, we have uh, three wells per target, and in white, uh, that's in the absence of TNF-alpha, and gray in the presence. And then on the right, we have uh, a series of the controls that I mentioned. So blanks, no lentivirus, HPRT, a number of biological controls, uh, and beta-lactamase. So how does it look? On the left, I'm showing you the interplate reproducibility of the controls. Um, so that library of 840 kinases uh, translates to about 16, 384 well plates, the way that we configured the assay. Um, so we have about 16 dots here representing uh, the controls, and you can see that these are clustered quite nicely. So our, our no lenti, uh, very little variation, a little more uh, from HPRT and CFOS, uh, and very tight grouping for TRAD, TNFR, uh, and beta-lactamase. On the right, what you'll see are black dots for each one of the targets. And then we've highlighted a few targets, CHUK, PLK4, NEC4, and PKN1, uh, that are known to be involved in some fashion in the NF-kappa B pathway. And then those, those colored bars represent the controls that I've shown you on the left and their uh, uh, standard deviations. So here we drew a red line. And in this case, this is a, a little bit arbitrary. This is based on, essentially, A, where the HPRT uh, 
control is. So we don't really expect HPRT to be having an impact, although we do see that there, there is something going on there that may be in part due to the virus. It may be in part due to some uh, ancillary impact of the HPRT enzyme on, on other enzymes in this pathway that is unknown to us. Uh, but we felt that anything above that we can consider a negative and anything below that we can consider a positive. We also want to, like any screen, uh, sort of pick a number that is relevant to the capacity that we have to follow up. So we draw that red line there uh, and capture all the hits below that. And that is shown here on our hit follow-up on the left, top left panel, we binned all the hits. And you can see that this histogram is a little bit asymmetric on the left. We obviously don't have a very clear peak, but those of you that are accustomed to looking at uh, small molecule screening, you'll always have that uh, bit of a trail on, on your hits. And again, we, we made a somewhat arbitrary line and captured uh, 75 hits to follow up on. What you see on the bottom left panel then are some compounds that we tested that are annotated to have uh, activity at specific kinases, so PLK4, uh, at PKN, uh, at IKK, uh, for instance. And those are called out uh, over here on the right where uh, NF-kappa B pathway diagram from uh, the KEG analysis and website uh, is highlighted with some of those known hits circled in red that are also represented then by the annotated compound. Um, so again, we do have, um, we do have uh, some known hits. Uh, we follow up with some known compounds in this assay. We also have a number of unknowns. Um, those are things that we are uh, following up on now using uh, both siRNA technology, uh, taking the guides and following up with the single guides for each gene instead of the four guide pool and testing other annotated compounds against some of these uh, putatively unknown kinases in this pathway. So hopefully sometime in the next year I'll be able to come back to you with some additional information about how uh, we followed up on these hits and uh, what we learned about the unknowns. Now, very briefly, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, um, work that has been done by one of our collaborators at Northwestern University, Dr. Simone Sredney. Uh, she has a longstanding interest in rare pediatric brain cancer. And as we were building out the library, she kindly offered to assist us in testing some of our prototypes. And she, using uh, parts of our kinase library, uh, developed an assay in a MON cell line uh, that she uses with collaborators from the Pasteur Institute that represents one of these uh, ATRT raboid tumors, a very malignant, very aggressive pediatric brain tumor. It's a rare disease. Only around 60 people per year may be diagnosed with this disease, but the prognosis is absolutely horrible. There is no treatment. Uh, if the children are treated, they may have a, a very short extension to their life, but uh, you know, this is a diagnosis that a doctor does not want to give to a parent. So Simone and her team took these viruses, they made a Cas9 mon cell, and then they introduced the guides into the viruses and created stable pools of cells and actually measured, shown here in the middle panel on the top, labeled B2, actually measured the time that it took the cells to reach confluence. And you'll see here, comparing uh, a set of kinases on the right, some of these are not listed because uh, Simone has identified some uh, very interesting targets that she plans to follow up on, but PLK4 is one that she's published already on. And I encourage you to check out this article. It is available open access. Um, and you see the PLK4 had a significant slowing to reach confluence compared to the negative control scramble and the positive control HPRT, which should have no impact on these cells shown on the bottom left bars. Uh, 
Uh, with her, we followed up by doing some NGS here at our site in Carlsbad, and this is looking at the PLK4 indels. And all these black lines essentially are showing you indels at that area, and we got very high levels of cleavage of PLK4 uh, with, uh, I think, three out of four of the guides, but one of them actually, which is shown on the top panel, which was in a slightly different loci, we didn't get uh, very good cleavage. Nevertheless, that was enough for us to be able to, to run, uh, for her to run these assays. On the bottom left, she's looking at these Ma9 Cas9 cells and then the Ma9 Cas9 PLK4 cells and asking how do they change in proliferation based on anti-KI67 staining. And you can see a significant difference between the Cas9 parental and the Cas9 that expresses the guide. In the middle panel, she's showing a clonogenic assay where they seed a small number of cells and ask what is the capacity of these cells to generate colony forming units. And you can see a very significant difference again between the Cas9 expressing line and the Cas9 line that has the guide. On the bottom right, this led them to ask then, well, how important is PLK4 in these cells? Because it had not been really caught by differential gene expression studies. But now when they look more carefully at normal brain tissue shown on the far right and non-embryonal brain tumor tumors versus the embryonal or ATRT brain tumors, which are the data sets shown on the two left scatter plots, they could see a significant difference between these ATRT and these embryonal uh, brain tumors versus, again, non-embryonal uh, or normal brain tissue. So that was a piece that... Uh, had not been appreciated before because it was a very small difference. It wasn't coming up out of the differential gene expression profiles. But here, based on the knockout data that she had, she was able to actually discover this difference in gene expression, which is, in fact, significant. She then went on to look at a compound that uh, a group in Toronto that she knew had been working on for a different oncology indication. And I believe this compound is being tested for uh, breast cancer, and it's a specific PLK4 inhibitor. And she asked, will this small molecule have the same impact as my knockout? And in this top panel, she tested that small mo molecule against the MON cells, as well as a series of other uh, ATRT-type cancers, G401, BT-12, and BT16. And these bars represent concentration response curves uh, at 48 and 72 hours. And again, especially at the 72-hour time point, you can see that with increasing concentration uh, of the compounds uh, against these cells in an MTT, proliferation assay, you can see a significant decrease in cellular proliferation of these cancer cells. She also ran clonogenic assays uh, of this compound against these cell lines using 50 nanomolar of the compound and again could show a very significant impact on the ability of these cells to form, clone, clonogen, uh, form colony forming units uh, in the clonogenic assay. So very, we were very excited by Simone's work here. Um, this was a very preliminary piece, and uh, she was able to very quickly extract value from these knockout studies, uh, and we just couldn't be happier that, again, as uh, Julie mentioned, our mission is to enable our customers to make a, a, the world a healthier place, and, uh, you know, this really aligns with that, and we wish Simone continued success. And we'll continue to collaborate with her, in fact, by now building a higher throughput assay that will allow us to work with her to test the rest of the kinome and perhaps the entire genome in some of these models to identify the best targets that may help uh, the children that are suffering from these diseases. So finally, I would just like to wrap up uh, and summarize what I hope uh, I have communicated to you today. Uh, we believe our Lenti Array CRISPR libraries are a powerful, high-throughput, loss-of-function screening tool that can be used to support target identification. These libraries are built as flexible systems that can be adapted to meet the needs of your screening goals and your model systems. We have 19 predefined libraries that give you the ability to construct custom gene sets and the flexibility to perform everything from a completely unbiased whole genome survey to highly focused screens. 
And again, I want to take that back to the very beginning of the talk. Although I have focused a little bit more on a pathway and a disease, remember that as you get hits that come out of phenotypic screens, this may be a way for you to deconvolute the targets that those hits are actually addressing. Uh, the Lenti array libraries contain up to four high-quality guide RNA constructs per gene, per well, and provide a library that is very effective in a wide variety of cell types. And I'm sure that uh, we and our other collaborators will continue to share more in the next year as some of this data comes out. The Lenti array library portfolio provides all the tools that you need to apply the power of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to your screening efforts. Uh, and again, uh, we have a great number of tools in our box around assay development uh, as well. And as mentioned, uh, these tools can be put to use on your behalf in our service offerings as well. So finally, with that, I'd just like to say again, thank you uh, for your attendance and participation today. Uh, it looks like we've got a number of questions that have lined up. And we will take those. Uh, and I will just, again, say thank you all uh, for your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Piper, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Also, we would appreciate your participation in a brief questionnaire, which you will see on your screen. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the presentation. So let's get started. The first question is, I was confused by the dual infection versus stable expression of CAS9. Can you talk a little bit more about that? When, why would you use stable expression versus dual infection of CAS9? Right, thank, thanks for the question. Um, so it, the, in some cases, uh, cells are immortalized cells uh, and can essentially be passaged in perpetuity. In those cases, it's it's typically relatively simple to apply the Cas9 virus, uh, allow it to stably integrate and select with blastocetin, and either use that stable pool or generate a clonal population and use that clonal population for the assay. Now, generally speaking, I think most people in the screening world feel a little more comfortable with that stable line because you feel like it, it, it's not going to drift, it's going to maintain the same properties from passage to passage and assay to assay. It's something that you could easily share with other colleagues or collaborators in your organization. On the other hand, there are certain cell types, including primary cells, that may be dividing but have limited uh, passage, have passage limits. Maybe they can only be passaged 20 times before they start to differentiate or change sort of their biology based on being in vitro for that long. So in those cases, it may be challenging to insert the Cas9 and go through the passages required to get the selected pool or clone. And in those cases, you really need to do the dual transduction, and that's really essentially based on the cell type. Now again, for cells that can be passaged sort of in perpetuity, you could do either one. So it, 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 you know, if time is of the essence, you might want to just use the dual transduction because you want to get the data. You know, generating the cell line obviously is going to take somewhere between one and three months, depending on whether you make a stable pool or a clone. So it's a little bit of a balance between the biology that the cell offers you and uh, the time that you have uh, to get your experiments done. Thank you. The next question is, can you talk a little bit more about when one would want to use a pooled versus array CRISPR library? Sure. So in the pooled approaches, in most cases, what people have done is you, uh, you apply a pool uh, that contains all of the guides for all of the genes. So let's say you have 20,000 genes times 10 guides. That's 200,000 guides. Now, you need to apply that pool to your cells at a high level of coverage, at least 
say a hundred fold, maybe a thousand fold. So you need at least uh, 200,000 times 100, what is that, 20 million or 200 million cells minimum to get your assay done. Uh, because when you apply the, the, the guide, something is going to change in the population. So when you knock out a gene, either cells are going to die, for instance, if you've got some cancer cells and you're looking for a gene knockout that kills them, they're going to either slow their proliferation or die. Or it's possible that you actually, when you knock out a gene, that the cells could be enriched. They might survive certain conditions better than the other cells. After that application, you're going to next-gen sequence your pool of cells, and you're going to look at the guides, and you're going to ask which ones are misrepresented, which have been depleted compared to your controls, or which have been enriched compared to your controls. So that approach works well as long as your assay, or the cell type, or the biology is going to allow you to be looking at the enrichment or depletion of cells. Also, you will need some bioinformatic analysis of those sequencing results, which is not necessarily the most straightforward thing. It can certainly be done, but not all labs have those tools today. Now, if you want to look at something more functional, like neurite outgrowth, or mitochondrial health, or phosphorylation of a protein, that's going to, that's going to be very challenging to do, do in a pooled approach. If you do that in, a, in an arrayed approach, you can make that measurement in the well with that target, and you will know immediately what the impact of that target was. And for that matter, even in a proliferation assay, while it can be done in the pooled approach, by doing it with the arrayed approach, you don't need to deconvolute anything. You will know directly from the assay which gene has an impact. So again, it, it comes down a little bit to logistics, time, and, and, and to the tools that you have at hand. Thank you. The next question is, what are some of the common challenges, issues, that you run into when running a CRISPR library screen? So I think you know, this, this comes really sort of to the same sorts of challenges that you face when you run any kind of high content or high throughput screen. You know, it's in part manipulating the cells themselves and making sure that you can get the proper number of cells in the well and keep them in that same state for a certain period of time and get substrate or antibodies on and off in order to make your measurements. Now, to that, you add the complication of having to get the lentivirus on to get high levels of transduction. And if you need antibiotic selection, then maintaining a relatively normalized cell number through that antibiotic selection. So you know, again, I think this really just comes back to working out the assay development in a stepwise fashion. And I think for each assay and each cell, those problems will be a little bit different. Uh, but again, it really comes down to getting good and efficient transduction, uh, getting the proper number of cells and keeping the proper number of cells over the duration of the assay uh, and optimizing uh, around your, your window. Thank you so much. We'll wrap up with one last question. And that question is, in your opinion, what do you think is going to be the next big advancement in CRISPR technology? What do you think is right around the corner? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, you know, certainly um, from the standpoint of the nuclease itself, there are, of course, different isoforms. Uh, and I'm sure that people will continue to evolve the existing isoforms so that we will get better cleavage efficiency and uh, less off-target effects. I think that design of the guides and our ability to accurately pr predict their efficiency uh, and their lack of off-target effect will increase. Um, you know, different delivery methods, perhaps, um, improvements in lentivirus or other viral transduction, um, the ability to use synthetic guides or in vitro guides in RNP complexes in certain cell types, um, better bioinformatic tools to analyze the data. Uh, I think those are all things that, that I'd expect to see in the next year or two. Okay, 
Um, it looks like we had one more question come in, and so we'll go ahead and ask that. Um, will you eventually generate a library targeting RNA binding proteins? Um, so once we have the entire genome uh, constructed, um, and I think our genome is somewhere between 18 and 20,000 genes, um, you will be able to access the content of that and configure any custom set of genes that you would like. So if you can provide a list of the RNA binding proteins that you're interested in, you will be able to go directly to our website and request uh, those genes to be configured. And I, I believe even configure them in whatever order you would choose uh, to. And you can do that uh, as pools or single guides. So we have a great deal of flexibility, actually, in the way the gene sets can be made. Uh, we're doing some custom uh, requests right now, uh, but we are trying to finish the production of the entire set uh, in order to make the custom generation easier in the future. I would like to once again thank Dr. Piper for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots and Thermo Fisher Scientific for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 25, 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>